Technology shapes our societies. Technology changes the way we handle our conflicts and the way we fight our wars. And this is not a truth about today. It's a truth which has been true forever. If you think about the wars we used to fight hundreds of years ago, we were fighting them with swords and bows and arrows because that was the best technology we had at the time. Then a bit later we were able to build warships, warplanes, satellites, cyber attacks, which meant wars and conflicts expanded from land war to sea war to air war to space war and yes, now cyberspace war. The terms and words and definitions around cyber weapons and cyber wars and cyber attacks are complicated. But the fact is, all modern conflicts use technology as a weapon. And cyber weapons are excellent weapons. Cyber weapons work. Cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. Effective, affordable, deniable. That's a pretty good weapon. It's a weapon which gets the job done. Japan, weapon which is cheaper than the alternative choices and, best of all, a weapon that you can deny that it wasn't your weapon to begin with. Or maybe you can use false flag attacks to make it look like the attack you launched was attack actually launched by someone else, potentially making the retaliation point to the wrong target. These kind of attacks are very hard to do with practical real-world weapons but perfectly doable with online cyber weapons. So now we have a war in Europe. And count me as one of those who were surprised. I wasn't expecting Putin to start a war. I wasn't expecting him to try to gain access to Kyiv with uh, military force. It seemed insane, especially in the sense that Putin was winning. For the last 10 years, Russia has been successful with their cyber operations, information operations, and hybrid operations. They've been using these against us, the West, to divide us. Russia knows that divided countries are weaker countries. And that's why they've been focusing on using troll factories and information operations and social media influence operations and voter interference operations to divide us successfully. How successfully? Well, over the last decade, we lost the country from EU. How's that? Or you look at USA, Democrats and Republicans have never been further apart. The goddamn capital was overrun by rioters, partly thanks to the conspiracy theories and information operations fueled by troll factories controlled by Russian government. Russia was winning. We were fighting each other, not them. They were dividing us successfully. And in that light, it was especially surprising to see Putin take his winning deck of cards. He had the winning cards in his hand and he threw them to the trash on the 24th of February. When Russia invaded Ukraine, we here in the West, at least momentarily, we forgot our infighting and we united behind Ukraine, and started to sanction Russia with the strongest sanction they've ever seen. Clearly, this was not what Russia had in mind. Clearly, this was not what Putin had in mind. And that's why it was so hard to see. But not everybody missed this. In particular, we have to give credit to US intelligence and to UK intelligence, because they saw this coming, and they were ready and willing to burn their sources to tell us that he's about to invade. We just didn't believe them. 
One press conference in particular stuck in my mind. It was President Biden giving a briefing to the White House press corps. And in his briefing, he said that he knows that Putin has already given the order to attack, and the attack will start in the next 10 days. Very concrete, very practical. He thanks the audience, he starts to walk away. Then one member of the White House press corps stands up and she asks, Mr. President, how do you know? And Biden turns around, comes back to the mic and says, United States of America has a significant intelligence capability. Thank you very much. And walks away. Sort of like a mic drop. So now, today, when the same intelligence agencies are telling us that we should be expecting cyber attacks from Russia to West, maybe now we should take them seriously. We, maybe now we should believe them. And we have to remember that what's happening in Ukraine right now is happening in the real world, but it's happening in the online world as well. And what's happening in the real world is not happening somewhere far away. It's happening right here in Europe. We're now in Helsinki. We're three hours away from Russia. Russia is right there. Ukraine is also right there. In fact, if you look at the map, Ukraine has 1,900 kilometers of border with Russia. Finland has around 1,340 kilometers of border with Russia. There are towns in Ukraine which are closer to us right now than some towns in Finland. Ivalo is further away than Chernobyl from where we are right now. This is happening right here, right now, in Europe. We have a war in Europe very concretely around us. And Ukraine is not just fighting for themselves, they're fighting for all of us. So all this talk about cyber attacks, what has Russia accomplished? Anything? Well, actually, yes. Yes, they have. I think the overall consensus is that Russians' attack have failed surprisingly much, both in the real world and in the online world. But clearly, they've had some successes as well. So what kind of successes they've had with, with their cyber attacks against Ukraine? Well, here's an example. You might remember news stories from the first weekend of the war speaking about massive queues on the Ukraine-Polish border with women and children who were trying to leave the, uh, the scene of the war, the safety of European Union, had to queue up to 24, up to 36 hours in freezing temperatures on the border. And journalists were mystified, like, why, why, is it, why is it taking so long? Why can't the people leave? Well, the answer is they couldn't leave because the computers of Ukrainian border control were overwritten by Hermetic Wiper, a destructive cyber weapon developed by GRU of Russian military. This, my friends, this is what cyber attacks look like in war. Very clear, very practical example. This is what they're trying to do. And they've been trying to do things like this over and over again. So the lack of activity in offensive cyberspace in Ukraine that we've seen over the last three months is not because Russia wouldn't be trying. They are trying. Why we aren't seeing more activity is because Ukraine is defending. Ukraine has been able to defend itself both in the real world, but also in the online world. In fact, I would claim that Ukraine is the best country in Europe to defend their networks against governmental attacks from Russia. Mark my words, best country in Europe. Better than Finland, better than any of the Nordics, better than Germany or France or UK. Why is that? Well, it's because they've been doing it for eight years. They've been doing it for real over and over again. When we do military training or military refreshers for here in Finland, I know because I do them myself regularly, we play war games, 
tabletop exercises, theoretical scenarios where we imagine imaginary attacks that we might see from an imaginary attacker and then play out how we would defend. Make believe. Well, Ukraine hasn't played make believe for eight years. They've played real deal. They've been defending their independence against real attacks from Russia for eight years, including attacks like the infamous cases that we all remember, not Petya, Prikarpato Oblenergo, and so on. And the attacks right now are ongoing. Right now, Ukrainian statistics that I'm getting from my contacts in Ukraine say that they are seeing maybe three times as more attacks as the same time last year. So it's not for the lack of trying. Russia is trying, but they're largely failing. Just a month ago, Russia tried cutting power in Ukraine again with the in Destroyer 2 attacks. They failed. One of the reasons why they fail is that Ukraine is not fighting alone. The West is helping. We are playing our, our small part in providing assistance, but the biggest difference from the West to Ukrainian government in defending against Russian governmental attacks is coming from big US-based software companies, for example, Microsoft and Alphabet, both of which, for the first time in history, are taking an active stand in the middle of a war to defend a country against foreign cyber attacks, against cyber weapons. This has never happened before. This is the first time. Last week, I met the director of the Microsoft's Digital Crimes Units Europe, and I asked her, the question, like, why? Why is Microsoft doing this? I mean, I, I like what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. Why? And, and she answered me, well, that it's very simple. They are, they are defending their customers. They have customers in Ukraine. They're defending their systems. Governmental customers, enterprise customers, they're there to defend them. But clearly, it's more than that. They may be not saying it out loud, but clearly they are taking a stand. And they choose to stand with Ukraine. And that means that powers didn't go out two weeks ago or three weeks ago in Kyiv. They have gone out before. When we look back to history, the attacks seven years ago, which got power on Christmas Eve's Eve from almost 250,000 people around Ukraine, are examples of that. The so-called Prikarbato Oblenergo attacks, which seem like a really high-end attack, that, you know, they're capable of attacking electricity networks and shutting down power distribution, countrywide power distribution. Well, that's true. However, these attacks themselves were not actually that hard to do, looking at what they were doing in practice. In practice, this, the Prikarpato Oblenergo attack started by sending an email sending an email which had an attachment, a Word document as an attachment. And that attachment was opened by an operator who was reading his email on the Windows workstation, which was connected both to public internet and to the operational network that they, they were using to operate the long-distance power grid of the country. Now, most European countries do not operate their power grid like that. We definitely don't operate our power grid like that here in Finland. So there were operational errors and design mistakes that were done as well, which enabled the attackers to gain access to the computers which could be used to control power distribution, after which they just looked and learned. A couple of weeks, just looked at the screen, learned how to use the systems, and then took over the control and started using the system to shut power. This is not science fiction. This is a Windows malware with remote control fu functionality and then someone who spends the time to learn from what he's seeing on the screen and then uses what he's learned to cut power. There were more advanced things related to it, including overriding the uh, serial to Ethernet converters with firmware updates, which brick them permanently, making recovery much slower. But nevertheless, this is what cyber weapons look like. Or another example we all know of, not Petya, 2017. And here's a good lesson that you can all take 
home with you and speak with your politicians and your decision makers and your governmental representatives. Imagine that the cyber attack hits your country and your country only. Not Petya was targeted against one country only. Yes, we all know it hit targets around the world, but it was targeting Ukraine. The, the, the distribution mechanism used in NotPetya was a local Ukrainian software company, and they used the update mechanism, update channel of that company to distribute the malware to Ukrainian companies. So vast majority of the victims were in Ukraine. Now imagine this happening in your country. Some local popular software company gets hacked by a foreign government, and they use the update mechanism to send a malicious update to a big part of the enterprises and companies in your country. Computers go down. And the trick is, when the computers go down, the screen doesn't say that Russia shut you down. No. The screen says that you've been shut down by ransomware, and you have to pay bitcoins, and then you will get your files back. And this was a cover story. This was a lie. This was fake. Not Petya was not ransomware at all. This was the cover story, which they used to play time. And the question we all should think about is that if this would happen in our country, who would be in charge? Who would investigate? Who would try to recover? Because this was a cyber weapon. This was an act of war. This should be a military matter. But to confuse the scenario, it claims to be a ransomware, which sounds like it should be handled by the cops. And this shouldn't be handled by the cops. This should be handled by the soldiers. And I know the answer you're going to get in your countries. You know, you're going to get the answer that it's complicated. Like, we, like how, why, when, how would we, how would we even know? How could we make the call that this was criminal or that this was governmental? This is why cyber weapons work. Effective, affordable, deniable, confusing. That's what they are. So I went back to my notes. I think this is the most iconic image of NotPetya. This is the one you typically saw in news stories. I went back to my notes to double check where this photo was taken. This was taken in a superstore. Hopefully a superstore automated by the Relax systems. I don't know, but I hope so. Superstore called Rost. You can actually see the name there next to the screen. Uh, and they have superstore uh, or shops everywhere around Ukraine. This one in particular was in the city of Kharkiv. So I googled what's happening regarding Rost Kharkiv. Well, it was bombed last month. Like this is what the situation in Ukraine looks like right now. Very real very real in the real world, not just in the online world. The attacks expand from computers to bombing real superstores. And to make this more complex, it's not just the government's playing part. We've seen the headlines about how anonymous or similar groups are volunteering to stand with Ukraine and are launching denial-of-service attacks against Russian targets. And we've seen Russian volunteer hackers like Killnet target, targets in the West. There's plenty of stuff like that. But I think the most important movements we're seeing are coming from organized crime gangs. One thing here that we should also accept is that Ukraine, historically, has been a major source of online crime. Make no mistake, there's plenty of online criminals from Ukraine, just like we see plenty of online criminals for, from all of the ex-Soviet states. And during these three months, we've seen a clear drop in the amount of, for example, ransomware attacks coming from Ukraine, which is pretty obvious, really. Like, the guys who used to be writing ransomware at their computers are now carrying a gun and are in the battlefield, so they don't have time to run cybercrime operations. That's pretty obvious. And at the same time, the Russian cybercrime gangs, many of them, at least some of them, have pledged allegiance to Russian government. Most important examples being, being the groups of Kuming Project and Conti. 
Conte, which is one of the most powerful cybercrime gangs active at the moment, Conti, which has been operating for several years, has around 200 employees, runs physical offices, pays salaries to their hackers, has lawyers and HR people and IT support in their payroll. I mean, this is a company, a criminal organization. And on the 25th of February, the war starts on the 24th. On the 25th, they post on their website in the Tor Hidden Service that they will be part of this war, and they will use their experience, their expertise, their tools, their exploits to fight for Russia. As soon as this started, we started seeing leaks from within Conti. It's a big organization. Some of the members didn't agree, and they started leaking information about the leadership of this criminal organization. So we now have Names and photos and home addresses of 21 Conti members, including some of the senior leadership. They've been outed. They've been doxxed. And you would think that a, an organized criminal gang wouldn't be able to continue operations after they've been outed and doxxed and after we were able to draw maps of their organizational structure. And you would be wrong. Because Conti has been continuing operations. It's business as usual for Conti, hitting targets in Europe and in North America. What kind of targets? Well, the kind of targets that would hurt, or let's say, that would benefit Russia the most. For example, this company, Nordex. They announced in April that they've been hit with a cybersecurity incident. That cybersecurity incident was Conti. Conte and their ransomware attacks. Why attack, attack this company? Because the best way Europe can stop funding the Russian war machine is to get rid of dependency on Russian coal, oil and gas. And the best way to get rid of our dependency on Russian coal, oil and gas is with nuclear energy. The second best thing, renewables. Nordex is one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers in the world. Target like this makes perfect sense for the Russian war machine. And in the middle of all this, Ukraine continues to function. Over the last three months, I've had multiple meetings with my colleagues and uh, with technical people and, and IT people in Ukraine, over Zoom, over Teams, over Google Meets. And every time I'm opening up a connection to Kyiv or to Lviv, I'm surprised. I'm surprised just about the fact that I can have a video meeting to a country in war. And in fact, not any video meeting. I'm getting great connections. I'm getting full HD image, no dropped frames. I'm getting better connections to Kyiv than to Stockholm. Which is quite remarkable, because they are in war. And once again, the fact that they have been able to maintain their connectivity is not because Russians would not have tried to cut it. They have. It's because they've been able to defend it. So how do you defend your connectivity in times of crisis, in times of wars? Well, you defend it with technical people working for local telecoms <coughs> operating in the battlefield, being next to a burned-out tank fixing fiber-optic cable which has been cut by Russian bombs, very concretely risking their lives to keep a country online, risking their lives to keep a country online. My friends, this is how important connectivity is in our times. It is very concretely a matter of life and death. And it does matter, because this is how we, the rest of the world, how we see what's really happening in Ukraine. This is how we see Zelensky's speeches. This is what we see the horrors happening in the battlefield. And this also means that we all have to take a stand. And taking a stand here is actually really simple. It's really obvious to all of us. I think we all choose 
to stand with Ukraine. We choose to stand with democracy, and we choose to stand against evil. It's a very simple choice for us to make. And during this war, we've again and again seen the images from the battlefield. And when we see the Russian tanks and the trucks, they carry the Z symbol. And on your computer keyboard, Control Z means undo. So what we should be doing right now is to control Z. Thank you very much. Mikko, that was a spectacular talk. I am both inspired and terrified, to be frank. Um, we have time for a question or a, or a reflection from the audience. So here is your chance to raise your hand and, and get the uh, microphone. We have a hand over there. It's working, right. Uh, well, first of all, as a Ukrainian myself, uh, thank you for the speech. It's right on uh, every point. And um, if Ukraine can succeed, as you say, does it mean uh, there is a lack of uh, motivation in other countries, in European countries as well? I do think so. Um, and of course, we're all confident that Ukraine will succeed. But it's also clear that cyber attacks and cyber weapons are here to stay. And I definitely don't want to over-exaggerate the importance of cyber attacks and cyber operations in this war, because the real tragedies and the real deaths happen in the real world. Mm -hmm. But fact is, we are now seeing more activity in, in cyber space than ever before during a conflict like this. I gave a talk to members of the IT Army of Ukraine two months ago, and in the end of that talk, which I did over Zoom, I wanted to give some hope to the people who were listening, and I ended my talk by telling them that this war will be over, and when it's over, we, the West, Europe, um, we want to be there. We want to do business with you guys. We want to help you recover. We will rebuild with you. Ukraine will rise, but Russia will not. Thank you. Let me ask you a final question. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I've spent 31 years now looking at the worst parts of the technological revolution. I've seen the scum of the internet, I've seen the online criminals, I've seen the all bad ways you can use the internet for. But I am an optimist. I see great hope in the future of of the internet. And I haven't always been an optimist. I picked this up, I cloned this, I copied or stole this from a Norwegian. Mm -hmm. I met this Norwegian polar explorer a couple of years ago. And we were chatting, he told about how he had skied through the North Pole and the South Pole and Greenland multiple times. As you do. <laughs> As you do. And he's, uh, he's been doing it for decades. He was an older guy and he, he told me that um, He's seen the effects of global warming with his own eyes. Of course, I mean, snow is escaping, and it's so obvious when you did it in the 1970s, and you do it now, and you see the change. And I asked him about his opinion on global warming, and he said, he told to me that he's an optimist. And I was surprised. Mm. Like, how the hell can you be an optimist when you see how bad it is? Yeah. And he told me that it's very simple. He's seen the change. He sees how quick it is. So he knows that it's too late to be a pessimist, and now we have to be an optimist. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.